Hello. Uh, so welcome to our viewers to the following virtual seminar on applied economics and policy analysis in Central Asia. So we're very privileged and excited to have Katrina Kosick today uh, from IFPRI. And Katrina is a senior research fellow in the development strategy and governance division at, the, at IFPRI. She's also the team leader for public investment. She uh, also teaches at John Hopkins University uh, on global political economy. She has published quite a bit on leading economics journals, such as Journal of Public Economics, Journal of Development Economics, uh, and so on. And she holds a PhD in political economics from Stanford University. And today she will discuss her paper on the effects of income fluctuations on rural health and nutrition. So, and we're privileged to have our discussants from uh, Westminster International University in Tashkent here at home, uh, Dr. Kahraman Yusupov. Uh, he's a senior economist and lecturer uh, with an experience for more than 10 years teaching at Wyatt. Uh, he has a PhD from Vanderbilt University. So, uh, welcome. Uh, Katrina and Kahraman, and to our viewers from around the world. So over to you, Katrina, please. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, uh, Bakram, this is very exciting. I think it's a great initiative that you guys are doing, and I really appreciate being able to reach a, a broader audience with all of the modern technology, so much appreciated. Um, and really looking forward to comments um, on this paper. I, I, it's, we're, we're right now making um, revisions to the paper, so it's a really, really great time to get uh, your feedback. So very much appreciating that. Um, so this paper is, is titled The Effects of Income Fluctuations on Rural Health and Nutrition. And I wanted to note that this is joint work uh, with Jia Song, who is a research analyst at uh, IFPRI with me. Um, she's also going to be a PhD student at the University of California, Berkeley, um, starting next fall. So we're very excited uh, to have her there and, and very excited to be, uh, very sad to be losing her, but excited for her. All right, so the research question we're asking in this paper is, how do household income fluctuations in the context of Kyrgyzstan affect health and nutrition outcomes? And also, how do these effects vary by both gender, one dimension, and also across the life cycle? We're gonna be considering several different primary outcomes to understand this question. But we're also going to be looking at some secondary outcomes so that we can understand what are the channels through which health is being affected. If health is affected, there must be some changes in behavior in the household or in the community that are happening. And we investigate at least some of those. And, and surely um, if audience members have other ideas of things we could, should consider, we will very much appreciate that. So the primary outcomes are um, basically breaking down by age group and then further by gender, um, various health and nutrition outcomes using uh, childhood anthropometrics, um, and then looking also at BMIs, obesity rates, and I'll get to those in more detail momentarily. And then secondary outcomes look at consumption uh, of food, uh, dietary diversity, health expenditures, as well as fertility-related attitudes and decisions. So, so what, what do we find in this paper? I think it will be helpful for everyone going forward to have in their mind what we're finding so that you can be duly skeptical about methods or, or have suggestions on other things to do. So what we find is that when you have a household in Kyrgyzstan that experiences a decline in household income from the previous year, we see a reduction in the heights and weights of young children, uh, one to five-year-olds, this is particularly concentrated on girls and, in, and also particularly concentrated among very young children, children under the age of two. We find lower body mass index or BMI scores among older children, so children above age five and, and adolescents, so all the way up to 18. And then we also find that when we look at adults, um, we find reductions in their body mass index, their BMI, and we see um, a, a, um, an incidence of overweight um, that is also declining as household income declines. 
so less less food um, consumption possibly, and you see these reductions in even adult weight. We separately look at younger adults um, in the 18 to 35 range, as well as older people, uh, myself included in the 35 and over crowd, um, and those individuals might have more susceptibility to weight gain and things like that. Um, several findings hint at likely channels that would explain these health results. Uh, in particular, when household income declines, we see reductions in food consumption. And we find that this is particularly large for healthy foods, uh, your, your fruits, your vegetables, um, these, are, these are declining. Um, we also see reductions in dietary diversity. So beyond total levels of consumption, we're seeing a less diverse diet, fewer food groups that are being consumed. We see reduced health expenditures and um, lower pregnancy rates and willingness to have additional children is also lower. So change in behavior in the household seems to explain what we find in terms of health and nutrition outcomes. Okay. So what is the motivation? Why are we writing this paper? Uh, first of all, I want to point out that we consider that understanding the impacts of income fluctuations is absolutely critical if you care about protecting the health, nutrition, and welfare of vulnerable groups. We know that the poor are especially susceptible to fluctuations in their income. They have, first of all, a higher arrival rate of negative shocks. They're just more exposed to shocks of all kinds, including health shocks, um, income shocks. Um, poor households, additionally, beyond their susceptibility to shocks, tend to underinsure against reductions in income. So they're unable to smooth out their income and enjoy the same consumption level over time through insurance arrangements, informal or formal, and they can often have major changes in their welfare uh, as a result of a shock the way wealthier households do not. And finally, one vulnerable group is women among the poor. And we know that the inability from existing research um, that the inability to smooth consumption disproportionately affects women. So this is a women's issue as well. There's a great large literature showing strong correlations between income and health. Um, uh, Cutler et al., Ada et al., uh, Curie, Banerjee et al., um, et cetera. There's a large um, uh, body of work showing these correlations. Causality is always challenging, right? We, it's very hard because income affects health, health affects income, and what do we make of the relationship between the two? This has led to a lot of people searching for natural experiments or actual experiments, and those have mostly meant that people have focused on considering extreme events that are sort of like a natural shock to your income, then let's see what happens to health, or they've looked at targeted cash transfer programs. Often cash, cash transfer programs are given out based on a proxy means test, which is basically a poverty score. And if you are above it, you, um, you're too wealthy for the program. Below it, you get the program. So you have events where there's randomized cash transfers or more likely cash transfers around a cutoff and you're using some sort of a regression discontinuity design to look at the impacts of those transfers. Again, the extreme events here I didn't mention are droughts, blights, prolonged blackouts, war and armed conflict, recessions, financial crises. You will find myriad different ones in the literature and certainly check out our paper which talks about some of this literature. But there are some external validity concerns with such studies. Great on internal validity, right? We, we have this natural shock. It's an experiment. We can study it meaningfully and know what the causal impacts are. But the problem is that First of all, extreme events can have major impacts beyond just impacting income. Um, they can have behavioral impacts like reduced life satisfaction, increased risk aversion, so all sorts of behaviors have changed going forward, how you confront the future, and even reduced aspirations for the future, less investments in the future. Um, small fluctuations in income day to day don't have these huge impacts that kind of tragic or large shocks do. So it's very hard to say whether we can extrapolate from those types of shocks to understand the day-to-day -day behavior within a poor household. So that's one concern about that literature. Cash transfer programs, on the other hand, often face the fact that, first of all, 
the programs are targeted at very specific poor populations. So it's impossible to generalize their impacts to the rest of the population of a country or even the poor population because programs often target a subset of those poor people. And second of all, the identification strategies employed to check out and understand the effects of cash transfer programs often include things like regression discontinuity designs. We know that with an RDD, you're estimating a local average treatment effect. You're seeing the effect of the program right around the cutoff. And this may not be the economically relevant population that we care to, to learn from. So there's some concerns with those studies. And this raises the important question that we try to tackle with our study, which is what are the health impacts of more commonly experienced modest fluctuations with income that may have, might affect anyone? And also, we've noticed there's very little literature about how the impacts of income fluctuations vary by gender and across the life cycle, so among very young children, older children, adolescents, youth, and older adults, um, very little literature kind of disaggregating those impacts. So we're going to try to present some results and, and convince you that we found a way to identify their impacts of income fluctuations. So our study context is Kyrgyzstan. It is a landlocked, mountainous, um, low income until 2014 when it moved to lower middle income status of uh, country. Agriculture is a big share in GDP, although it is sliding during our study period from 33% in 2004 to 13% in 2016. Not surprisingly to this group, the vast majority of agricultural production is occurring on small individual farms. And what we see in this context is significant progress over the last two decades on child health and nutrition outcomes. So there's a definite trend going on. We're going to control for that with, with uh, year fixed effects, but we see stunting affecting almost a third of children under age five in 1997, but that drops to only under 13% in 2014. So this 40% decline in stunting over 17 years, phenomenal. Um, the incidence of overweight has actually creeped upward during, uh, during this time, um, but very slightly. It's kind of steady at about half of the population, both in 1990 and in 2013, uh, being overweight. There's a universal healthcare system, but there's reports, I've read a lot of uh, uh, sociological studies on this, and there's reports of informal payments for some services that persist in some places. So this can make access problematic or at least a bit costly for the poor. So the data we use are from the Kyrgyzstan Integrated Household Survey. And we in particular employ um, not all, we, we for reasons of availability of income data, do not use the 2003 data, but we use this rotating panel spanning 2004 to 2016. And the outcomes we're going to consider are, for young children aged one to five, we'll look at their heights, height for age Z scores or HAS scores, the prevalence of stunting, their weight, their weight for age, um, uh, weight for height Z scores. So doing a, a doctor's exam on, on young children, at least through the, the KIHS um, survey data here. Older children, um, we're looking at weight, height, and body mass index. Um, and then for adults, we look at weight, body mass index, um, as well as incidences of overweight and obesity. I should say that the reason that in older children we don't look for overweight and obesity is that thankfully in this country, certainly not in my own, the incidence of overweight and obesity among um, older children is infinitesimally low, um, under 1%. So there's not a lot to explain there. Okay, so um, total income in this context is, is summed up in the household survey by taking non-agricultural income. So this is everything from wage labor, um, self-employment income, transfers from government, transfers from private sector individuals. Um, in addition to that, we look at agricultural incomes. Um, so uh, these, this involves crop production, livestock sales, meat production, um, hunting and gathering, as well as processing of food. And then we subtract from this the agricultural costs, the costs of producing uh, these, these uh, getting this income from agriculture. So there's crop production costs as well as livestock costs. So this 
graphic shows you the distribution of years of entry into our sample. I mentioned we have a rolling panel, so not surprisingly, between 2004 and 2016, you see households coming in each year. Um, what we see, though, is that the, in, our, in our data, we see that the median household is in our sample for four years. And a lot of households entered in 2004, which is the first year. In 2013, for reasons I don't know, but please, if anyone knows, let me know. Um, for some reason in 2013, the entire sample was dumped and a brand new sample was taken. So you see a, a high entry at two points, which is both 2004 and 2013 as being the times when people come in. We have you know, almost 60% of the sample entered in one of those two years and a relatively even spread over uh, other years into the sample. Now I talked about how we're going to be looking at the impacts of fluctuations in income. So income is our, is our independent variable, our main right-hand side variable. So what we are plotting here is trying to see, well, year to year, how much is income changing? Uh, how, if you look at your income from this year relative to last year, is it 5% more? Is it 100% more? Is it 5% less, 100% less? Um, this graphic plots that data. And here we've taken the absolute value of the fluctuations. So this could be a negative or a positive fluctuation in income. Um, and we find that on average about 35 and a half, so 36% um, is the so average size of an income fluctuation. What that means is that on average, your income changes 36% from the previous year. This is a relatively big fluctuation and it reflects the fact that there is some substantial variability in our sample period and our sample context. We're looking in our study um, at households that have at least some income from agriculture, so this might explain why there's a relatively high uh, fluctuation. So here are the top three income or, or cost sources uh, right here. I wanted to plot these from 2004 to 2016 to show you kind of trends over time during the study period. And in the black line at the top, you see that non-farm income is sort of steadily increasing, um, not monotonically because of this 2004 to 2015 drop, but the steady increase over time. Income from crops is a bit, uh, is a bit uh, less monotonic. It's in, it seems like a steady increase, but we have uh, declines uh, between several of the study years here, 2009 to 2010, we see a decline, steady declines after 2014. So income from crops is sort of uh, uh, going up and then down. Income from meat production, pretty steady here throughout the period, but much lower. And I'm not presenting um, income sources that are much lower here because you get a lot of the sense of, of, of things by looking at these. Here's some trends in our outcome over time. I think it's always good to get a visual picture of your outcomes before you're running regressions and trying to understand how they're changing over time. And we see that very, for different outcomes, they have very different shapes of, of, of trends over time. With height, we see this sort of minimum height being reached around 2012 and higher on other ends for one to five-year-olds. Um, for weight, we see a similar pattern, although there's sort of this um, you know, peak at, at 2007 um, that's not achieved again until about 2014. Um, and, and you can kind of appreciate the relationships and other, um, uh, other outcomes here. Weight for age, these scores in young children are sort of moving up and down a little bit over time. Very um, steady increase in reporting that people are in good health. Um, uh, weight for height, Z scores are kind of, you know, plateauing after um, a relatively early period in the sample. Um, one thing that's very clear in these figures, if we look to the older and more adult outcomes here, is those over age 35 are definitely getting heavier. They have higher weight, higher body mass index, and a higher incidence of being overweight. Um, we see a decline in body mass index actually for older children um, over much of this period. Um, uh, this body mass index, uh, first, first figure here for five to 18 year olds. Um, for youth though, the opposite. For 18 to 35 year olds, they're much like the older adults of seeing this kind of increase over time. So what's our empirical strategy? Well, what we do is a Bartik instrument strategy. 
and we're going to construct a variable, I'm showing the formula here, that is going to predict your income. And we're gonna try to predict your income not with things related to your specific household, but rather looking at your livelihood in the first year you enter the sample. Again, for a lot of households, that's 2004. For some households, it's a later year. And we look at how much you depend on uh, livestock for income, crops for income, non-farm income, et cetera. And we're looking at that sort of what share of your income is coming from that or how much income is coming from that particular source. Then we look at growth rates in income in that sector in your oblast. In particular, we say your oblast area type because um, we don't have information on lower subgeographies like rayons um, and other community identifiers, but we know if you're, we know your oblast and whether you're in a rural or an urban part of your oblast. So we have this oblast times area type. Um, uh, we have 15 of these in the sample. And we look within your oblast area type in each year and see how growth in each type of income is changing. So do this growth rate G here is indicating whether we have an increase or a decline in the revenue that you get from a particular sector. So we're basically using community-wide data on what's happening to each of the sources of income that you depend on at baseline. Now, we are controlling for these baseline um, shares of income from different sources so that hopefully these aren't endogenizing our regression. And we're using this larger, much more aggregated information on changes in the growth rates of these income sources over time. So we're predicting that, for example, if you're heavily dependent on crop income and your oblast sees a massive increase in crop income over a period, we imagine that you also will benefit from this massive increase in income. So we're predicting with this aggregated information and your initial exposure to a sector, what your income is going to be later on. And I'll show you in a bit here that we do a, a relatively good job of that by showing you our first stage regression where we'll be regressing um, our actual income on the predicted income. So what does that mean that our first and second stage equations are? Well, you'll see them here, and we're basically um, looking at uh, uh, log logged um, health. Uh, we have an outcome, and we're regressing it on income in our second stage in the second equation there. And in the first, uh, first regression, we're basically using this predicted income um, and trying to predict actual income with it. We try different control sets. In general, we always use year fixed effects, oblast fixed effects, a rural dummy, um, uh, initial values of the of your exposure to different income sectors. So we allow people to be on different trends, different secular trends according to their baseline exposure to different sectors. And then we also try adding a lot more controls. And generally, I'll say that our results are not uh, sensitive to the addition of these extra controls in our full control specification. All right, so I mentioned that we have a strong first stage. You can see it here. Uh, basically what this regression is showing you with these uh, coefficients all hovering around 0 0.6, 0 0.7, is that predicted income indeed gives you higher income. So we're doing a good job. We've got F statistics here that are above 400 in all specifications. So really strong. There's no problems of weak instruments here. Um, we're very much predicting your income with this predicted income. Uh, Katrina? Yes. Uh, just one clarifying question here. Um, the question is from Laura Moritz. Uh, how does KIHS integrate data on height and weight? Is it reported by the respondents or measured by interviewers? Great question. So we've been trying to understand that and we are not sure. I will say that if anyone knows more about this, we'd love to hear it. The data are, are, are listed without instructions that were given to enumerators on measurement. We do know that um, the, the numbers are a lot less noisy starting in about 2008. Um, which kind of has made, made us suspicious that perhaps in 2008 was the first year that they actually measured it as opposed to doing self-reports, but I'm honestly not sure. Our hope is that uh, any measurement error here would be uh, random noise as opposed to sort of um, correlated with income or, or, or things like that. That would be worrisome if it were correlated with income. We would love anyone to share information they have though about the actual measurements. Um, I, I will say that I, I speak 
English and Spanish. It's been no use to me with uh, dealing with the original manuals, but we had things translated and didn't see instructions given on this. So it'd be helpful to know. Um, so uh, yep, again, here we've got these strong first stage results. Now let's jump into sort of looking at our um, outcomes here. So what we find at is that income fluctuations indeed have a strong statistically significant impact on height of young children. These are children ages one to five. And in the interest of time, I'm not gonna show the OLS results, but they are strikingly similar to the IV results. They're just not much different. Here I'm showing you the IV results. Um, so we have that, and, and we measure income in two ways. All of these anthropometrics are measured in the first quarter of a year. So looking at the previous year's income is a natural um, way to examine this, but we also wanted to take into, the account, into account the fact that income may have a lagged impact. So we also um, estimate a specification in which we consider income, not in the previous year, right before you're, you're measured, but in uh, two years prior. So I'm gonna present results with both of those, but you can see here in the panel A, the, the one year lagged, so just immediately prior to the quarter one measurement, and then panel B, you can see uh, two years lagged. And again, we see that results are, are generally here um, showing that you have um, height for age Z scores are, are, are definitely the most statistically significant here uh, results because whether or not we have controls, we have these significant results. And in particular, we find that a 36% reduction in income, this average sized reduction in income is corresponding to about a 0 0.06 uh, standard deviation reduction in height for age Z scores. Um, basically, we've got to multiply the coefficient here by the log of 1.36 in order to find out what a 36% fluctuation in income does, but it's about a 0 0.06 standard deviation reduction in these height for age Z scores. So a relatively substantial impact. Um, certainly it's nothing like the 0.4 standard deviation um, impact uh, you see on things like exposure to civil conflict uh, or uh, civil wars, things like that, but it's a modest impact for these um, very typical um, average, in fact, um, reductions in income. You see that there's not much going on with stunting. We have this, you know, a reduction in income, so a negative income uh, would result in an increase in stunting, but these results are definitely not statistically significant. So now let's look at children by gender. And here we see a, very interestingly that the results for girls are, are standing out much more than the results for boys. This is really implying that boys are more protected than our girls from the negative health impacts of income fluctuations. So we see that for boys, we have no impacts on height for age Z scores, no impacts on stunting, in fact, no impacts on height at all. But for girls, we have this substantial um, increase in uh, a reduction in height with a negative income shock and stunting, which is, is, is worrisome too. Um, so we have these um, impacts that are just uh, su suggesting that about, the, if you do the, the math here, it's about a 3.5 percentage point increase in stunting for girls after a year. And it's actually increasing to a 3.5 eight percentage point increase in stunting after two years with this average size income fluctuation. So, so fairly large here. Um, if we look at weight, here we see um, uh, again results where weight, a negative reduction in income is resulting in lower weights, lower weight for age Z scores, and lower weight, weight for height Z scores. So the, whatever way you measure it, children from one to five are negatively affected. Again, if we look by gender, here interestingly we see that both boys and girls appear to be affected. Um, and it's not a story in this case of um, girls being substantially more affected. We can't really, um, uh, the, the, the coefficients for boys and girls here are statistically very similar and we can't reject that they're the same. Okay, so the effects of income, now if we look at older children, so these are your five to 18 year old children, little impacts on white weight and height. Not surprising, at this age, it's a lot harder to move weights and heights of young children, um, or at least to move height, uh, to change heights. But the body mass indexes of these children um, are affected. And in particular, if income declines, the body mass index of older children declines. 
not necessarily a bad thing. It depends kind of on the initial level here, but, but this is a, the finding we have here related to the body mass index of older children. Um, all right, moving on to the next slide here. So now let's look at youth, 18 to 35 year olds. And what we're finding here is once again, no impacts on height and weight. Very, we consider it sort of a nice useful placebo uh, analysis here to find no impacts on uh, height because you would not expect height to ever change past 18 in any meaningful way, especially just due to an income uh, fluctuation. But what we are seeing is in the panel A here in the, you know, one year after, you know, after this uh, income shock, we're seeing that a negative shock to income lowers body mass index. It um, lowers, it, 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 it contributes to um, being overweight. Um, so we, we find kind of this um, uh, relationship here that is suggesting um, overweight becoming a, more of a problem. Now, if we look at, um, uh, um, if we look at, sorry, overweight is, is becoming less of a problem, my apologies. Um, reductions in income, so we take a negative um, of this 0 0.067 coefficient in, in panel A here, uh, reductions in income are, are leading to less overweight. Um, so, so this is one good side we think of it as, as if, if lowering income actually can reduce the, the um, problem of uh, overnutrition, that could be a very good um, feature of it. Now, if we look at adults over age 35, you see the stars are lighting up here more. Once again, we have no impacts on height, which is a very useful placebo analysis, but we see that a negative shock to income is lowering weights, it's lowering BMIs, it's lowering the incidence of overweight. Again, we're not getting anything here on obesity, um, the positive but very small and statistically insignificant coefficients. So, um, Reductions in income, though, are reducing the incidence of overweight, and there is in reducing it quite uh, quite substantially here. Um, so we're we're seeing that um, uh, these relate these coefficients here are largest for the 35 year olds, and among those over age 35, we see that a 36 percent reduction in income is leading to about a 0.3 unit reduction in BMIs and a 4.3 percentage point decline in the instance of, of overweight. So 4.3 percentage point decline in the incidence of overweight is huge um, uh, uh, to, to have from a typical shock to income. All right, so why is this happening? Very quickly, I wanted to note that we find that there is when there's a negative shock to income, we're seeing less consumption of fruits, less consumption of fresh vegetables, less consumption of fish and seafood. Possibly this is causing, and also less consumption of dairy products. Possibly this is contributing to the health problems among young children. We also see less consumption of sugar. That might all be contributing to the health benefits by older adults who are seeing less incidence of overweight. Um, so you have less money to spend, you're spending less on, um, on um, sugar and, and refined um, foods. And we also have this counter cyclical finding where meat and poultry consumption actually goes up when you have a reduction in income. Possibly people are slaughtering their animals to eat when they don't have as much income from other sources. Um, but this is a result we find on consumption. Very similar results when instead of whether you consume a, a, a good, we look at the amount you consumed of that good. Um, so we, we kind of have this, this traditional story of healthy foods being consumed less. Well, what happens to dietary diversity? What happens to the number of different food groups? Here you see in the rows the different food groups that we considered. And dietary diversity usually just involves counting up how many of the food groups you are actually consuming. And what we see here is that uh, we have reductions both in household dietary diversity score, which is the first column, and a what we call a healthy household dietary diversity score, where we look at the very healthiest um, uh, fruits, vegetables, I think seafood is in here, um, the very healthiest foods. Um, and what we're finding is both of these uh, indices are, are moving with um, are moving with uh, income changes, and in particular, a reduction in income um, of about 36%. So again, our, our typically sized reduction leads to about a 0 0.08 standard deviation decline in household dietary diversity. 
and it leads to about a 0 0.07 standard deviation decline in our healthy household diet diversity, dietary diversity uh, index. So diets are lower quality as a result of reductions in income. So what about healthcare expenditures? We wanted to consider this, even though um, health expenditures are relatively low in this context, um, they can be very um, costly for the poor. And what we find is that when you see a, a decrease in income, you have a decrease in outpatient expenditures. So the types of expenditures where you're going to go into a medical care facility, get treatment and come out as opposed to spending the night. Uh, we see that in both the year um, right after a, a reduction in income, as well as when the income reduction was two years ago. So these are persistent impacts. Um, we see impacts on inpatient expenditures, but those don't really materialize until um, uh, they materialize with the delay and they're a bit smaller. Um, so these are really large. Um, if we look at the size of these, of these coefficients, a typically sized 36% reduction in income is leading to about a 42% reduction in expenditure on outpatient costs a year later. And after a two-year lag, we find statistically significant and even larger impacts on both types of medical expenditures. We see after two years, a 70% decrease in outpatient expenditures and a 22% decline in inpatient expenditures. So these reductions in investments in healthcare could also explain declines in health when, when income goes down. Um, and you can think that outpatient care, which might be the less urgent type of care, is, is kind of the one we would expect to be most affected. If you need to be hospitalized because of some major issue, you may do so and borrow, or do whatever you need to. You really can't um, avoid that, but you can avoid a lot of outpatient expenditures, and that's what we're seeing in the data. And then finally, we looked at fertility decisions, and we have three questions about this. The first is whether the individual practices contraception. You can imagine that this is a question where answering this might be seen as a bit private and hard to get data on, which statistically we know that might lead to some noisy data. The second is whether the individual is currently pregnant. Um, and the third is whether the individual indicates wanting additional children. We find that a reduction in income increases the practice of contraception, but not statistically significantly so. We've got a p-value, I think it's something like 0.12 here. So it's close to being significant, but it is not. Um, but we find that the reduction in income actually statistically significantly reduces the likelihood that you are pregnant, and it reduces um, the likelihood that you want additional children, indicate wanting additional children. These effects, again, are persistent. We find them whether we measure income with a one or a two year lag. So fertility decisions and attitudes may be offsetting the negative effects. In particular, if you do not get pregnant, if you do not have another baby, you have more resources in the household and in your body to invest in other children. So these reductions in income, which may negatively affect children already born, young children, may be even worse if there weren't this counteracting fertility response that is resulting in, in sort of blunting the negative impacts by reducing the resource demands on the household. So to conclude, I think I'm out of time here, but we find that declines in household income are really threatening the health of young children. Um, and, um, but we find that by the time individuals are over age five, declines in household income start to have potentially beneficial impacts like lowering body mass indices, which may be not a great thing for five to 18 year olds, um, but for adults, lowering your body mass index can be a good thing. And we find indeed it likely is a good thing for, for adults because we find that the incidence of overweight, which we know is not a good thing, is also declining with reductions in income. So there could be some potential health benefits. Um, impacts are particularly for young children centered on girls, very young children, so it's not evenly felt um, across genders and across um, ages. 
And then we find that this is likely, the, the results are likely due to reduced food consumption and health expenditures and less dietary diversity as a result of reductions in income. But we also see an offsetting impact where lower pregnancy rates and lower willingness to have additional children um, may be contributing to more resources that can be spent on already uh, existing children. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Katrina, very much. Uh, I understand it's 8 a.m. in Washington, D.C., so uh, I very much appreciate that. It's, usually it's not the first thing people want to do uh, when they wake up in the morning. But, uh, oh, I'm thrilled to be here. It's a quiet so, morning this way. I love it. <laughs> so thank you very much. So I, I would like to remind our viewers uh, to type in their questions while I give the floor to our or screen to our discussant to uh, give his comments on the paper, and then I'll open up for general Q&A. Okay, Kahraman, over to you, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Katrina. This, this, is a, uh, this was a very interesting topic, and uh, uh, given the circumstances, I think it's even more uh, relevant, I think. Um, yeah, I think I, I would be really surprised if nobody in the in the audience would be interested in replicating your exercise for Uzbekistan. Uh, you know, Kyrgyzstan is our neighbor to the east. We have a lot of things in common. We have more in common than than differences. It's a uh, fellow CIS country. We have common history. Um, so yeah, I think um, this is a very uh, this is a very uh, important topic for us as well. Um, because uh, our population is also susceptible to income fluctuations due to the same reasons, I think, as uh, Kyrgyz uh, people. Um, uh, we have a majority rural population, very large share of, of youth who are vulnerable in the labor market, um, millions of labor migrants uh, who send back remittances who are uh, very vo volatile and uh, prone to high, uh, you know, uh, jumps in uh, uh, due to economic uh, 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 situations in Russia and Kazakhstan. So uh, yeah, so this is this is very relevant. Um, um, so. Uh, Having said that, I, I will take the liberty to presume that most of uh, questions will be uh, related to the methodology. Uh, you, 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 you've used uh, IV approached, uh, you, you, you applied IV here. Uh, and, um, you know, IVs, uh, IV tends to have a rep reputation. Uh, it's um, uh, all the methodological methodology. I mean, theoretically, it's sound and uh, maybe even clever, but uh, but in practice, it's rare when it's where it's very convincing. Okay, because of because of, of weak instruments, sometimes even invalid instruments. I think it's 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 uh, it's especially uh, true for Uzbekistan because uh, we don't have access to uh, uh, panel household surveys. We have uh, several household surveys, but they're one, all of them are one off. I mean, uh, like uh, even those panel surveys that I know of, they span, span two years, maybe three at most. So, so it's not easy to, to apply this, uh, this, IV, uh, uh, I, the, this kind of IV uh, methodology. But I, I would be very much in, interested in looking into the reasons for why you have such, a, such strong instruments. I mean, Probably, I mean, maybe income inequality. Income inequality I mean, maybe the uh, the Gini coefficient has to do with it. If if a lot of people are of the same income level and in the same kind of industries, maybe that may play into the strength of the instruments because you know everybody have the same kind of growth rate in their income as as their neighbors. So. Um, yeah, and uh, so I, I would be if, if you have any comments for why you uh, you've uh, uh, ended up having such strong instruments, I, I would appreciate it, and I think everybody would. Um, 
apart from that, uh, I'm also interested in, in your comments regarding your uh, uh, regressions of uh, food consumption, food consumption. Um, did, did, you have a, did you ever feel that, you know, the zero consumption could be an issue because you see this uh, living standards measurement survey type surveys, they, when the, in the, the questionnaire is designed in a way that the question asks how much you spend on food over the last seven days. And uh, uh, this is a very short, uh, short uh, time period for, for, for the question. I, I, it's understandable that, you know, people want to avoid measurement errors and, you know, lapse in memory and things like that. But, uh, but on the other hand, it's the other uh, 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 side of the, uh, this, 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 uh, this kind of question is that there are going to be a lot of zero consumption uh, entries, you know, people, because people, people buy, buy in bulk. Right, so you may you will not see consumption of certain food items over the last week, and another factor is that some most uh, rural households they tend to grow their some of their food items on their backyard. Um, uh, so, uh, did you ever think uh, that zero consumption may result in kind of some maybe bias in your uh, in your estimates? So, well, I would want to you know I would appreciate if you provide uh, comments on that as well. Okay, thank you, uh, Kahraman. Uh, Katrina, over to you, and then I'll read some of the questions I find very relevant. Um, Great. Well, well, uh, Kahraman, thank you so much for those comments, which are very helpful. Um, I, you've got me energized now to try to link this up with the current uh, COVID-19 epidemic a little bit more for possibly the lessons that, um, that we can learn about majority rural, large youth population context, which describes, I'm sure, a lot of, the, a lot of other countries as well, um, you know, even in Africa, um, and sort of uh, what are the lessons that we can take about what fluctuations in income do. Um, so thank you for that um, uh, feedback there. I've, I'm already seeing a, a blog post or something <laughs> extending the lessons of the paper to kind of to share those results. Um, uh, thank you also for the methodology comments. Um, I'd like to start first with the, the last comment um, about consumption. I think this is a really good point. Um, you mentioned that seven days, you know, being a small period and because you buy in bulk, maybe that you're not capturing some purchases. I think this is a very valid point, one that I haven't actually thought about um, in the past. I've been talking nutri to nutritionists who are concerned that seven days is way too long, that you should be doing... Um, you know, 24 hour food consumption recall as opposed to, um, to doing, uh, uh, doing anything that's longer. But I, I, I take the point on bulk. I, I need to revisit the question wording specifically. I'm forgetting exactly what it said. I don't remember if it's talking about um, amount actually consumed or expenditures. Um, I thought it was about consumption, but I'm not, now you've made me not confident on that and I'm, I'm going to check. I would agree with you. If it is expenditures, we could have a worrying problem. And the problem is even more worrying because there are certain products that might be accurately measured. Maybe the frequently purchased products would be perfectly accurately measured and then some products would not be. So we'd have different num amounts of measurement error across different categories. And then what happens when you sum that up into a dietary diversity index where you have different measurement error in different products. So I'm going to check into that. I'm hopeful we'll find that it's actually just the amount consumed. Whether or not that's measured with error. I'm hoping it's what people have actually ingested and consumed um, because then it would get away from two concerns that you pointed out, one of which was the certain categories of expenditure are bought in bulk and will not be seen in the last seven days. Um, and the second one being your, your really good point about the fact that if you are growing something in your backyard or getting it from a neighbor or some source that doesn't result in kind of going to the market, then um, could we be missing it? So I will um, get back on that and I'm hoping we find that it's just the, the amount consumed. I have my concerns, of course, even if it is amount consumed about the fact that um, this may be measured with incredible error, and I don't know if the most knowledgeable person uh, about food in particular ends up being the respondent, um, but um, I, I, I'm going to get back on that. Um, I agree. I, I've, I've 
done way too many instrumental variables papers in my lifetime, and I'm, I'm kind of getting sick of them because you're right. There's a very uh, Ivy having a reputation. I love that statement. It's so true. Um, it's, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, yes, pulling apart instruments has to be the first question in any seminar. Um, I completely agree. Um, so, so a few a few things on the instrumental variable. It's slightly different in flavor from your standard instrumental variable, where you're trying to just eye the horizon and look for something that is. Um, hopefully arguably exogenous. It won't be. You'll try to argue it is. That's what I've done in all my papers. Um, but I, th this one is a bit more of trying to look at, um, you know, you're constructing it, you're simulating it. And the, that construction process itself is really what delivers this high F statistic. In particular, you're using very specific information about the household at baseline that is, is really leading to the strength. And what you're hoping is that these shocks to different sectors really do allow you to do a good job in predicting income. That, that if one household is, is affected substantially by um, increase in crop prices that make crop income go up, that every household is, of course you could get that wrong, right? Increases in crop income could be due to one crop that just skyrockets in price and a household that doesn't grow that crop actually would not see an increase in crop income. And we would do a bad job predicting that that household, for that household that their income um, increases. We do a good job for the household that actually cr did that crop. We do do a good job o overall and on the whole. Um, what your question is really making me think more about now though is who are we doing a good job for and who are we not? Because identification is coming from the people who we're doing a good job for. The people that are being moved by our instrument, that's the local average treatment effect that we're estimating. And, um, it, you know, I'm, I'm sort of wondering almost if this would be helped by doing something like further disaggregating crop income into crop income by types. And then the instrument would be, you know, movements and we, we would really be identifying, we, we would almost more, we would more have better put, we might by creating more categories be able to get an instrument where identification is coming from all households or more households as opposed to a subset that might be exposed to those crops that are growing quickest or slowest over time. So I'm gonna think about that on sort of instrument construction. We actually are um, nicely at a moment now where we're thinking about retweaking the construction. Um, in terms of external validity, I will share, I guess, right, one thing we're doing right now. Um, we've been hammered by a referee by, who said that the validity of using a price, we're, we're basically looking at a, a shifter in, in, in the Bartik instrument terminology, a shifter, which is this growth rate of income in each sector. We've been looking at it at the Oblast level. And it, in particular at the Oblast times rural urban level. So there's like 15 different, you know, shifters. There are 15 different um, um, uh, um, markets effectively. And we've been basically told it would be better if you looked at national prices because these are going to be more exogenous to the household itself. So don't use an Oblast specific growth rate in crop income, use the Kyrgyzstan wide growth rate and in crop income, then your instrument will be more exogenous because it's going to be this national information, this national level. We're further even thinking of whether when we compute the national growth rate, we might omit not only you and your household, but your entire oblast from the calculation of the growth rate for you so that we have a more exogenous growth rate. I don't know if that's compelling at all, but that's kind of what we're thinking is that if we can get the growth rates are the where I'm a bit more concerned about it being a, a, you know, sufficiently exogenous and maybe getting a higher level of well, like a growth rate of income, crop income, livestock income, non-farm income would be, would be better. Um, but yes, I, Bartik instruments have historically high F stats. We've got ones over 400. You see papers with Bartik instruments with F stats over 3,000. So we're we're not far from the, like the strength delivered, but it's a very I mean it's you're 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 building it specifically. You're doing whatever you can to get a high F stat and the way you construct it. But then again, using more exogenous information may cost us a lower F F stat, but maybe it'd be more exogenous. So we're gonna try that.
thank you, Katrina. So we have close to 20 questions and we have five minutes left. So <laughs> I'll answer them all. Go for it. Uh, yeah. So I will ask two uh, I will ask two questions and then uh, I will uh, promise the viewers that I will share other questions with the uh, authors and they will have your questions afterwards to think about. But uh, the two questions I will ask is, uh, one is uh, from Martin Petrick uh, asking, do you have more information on the home production of food by the households you investigate? Uh, this may indeed have an effect on the food choices they make. It also opens additional channels of how income affects food availability. Uh, to this effect, I also had a question when I saw the results on meat. Uh, so, uh, and I thought uh, maybe if they're slaughtering more of their uh, livestock, uh, do you have any information the per about the percentage of households with their own livestock in rural areas? And I'm sure if you, I think KHS has that information. Uh, the second question is related to uh, about the policy implications of your results. So there are many uh, three or four questions on this. So uh, the, basically they're asking if these households are affected by income shocks, uh, what, a, what would be some of the targeted policy measures and uh, your insights coming from your research? So those two questions and then we'll, we'll close. Thank you. Great questions. Thank you so much. Um, our consumption, I believe, includes home production, and I know our income includes um, home production. I fully agree that this may affect food choices, and so I, I think that it might be interesting to look at heterogeneous treatment effects by exposure to or, or access to sort of home production of food. Um, so I'm going to think about that more. It's a great idea, and I think it's highly implementable. We may even bring that into the construction of the instrument in a way. Um, uh, same. I, th I think their question on meat really relates to that and slaughtering livestock. So we could also look at livestock access. What are the factors that affect and, and dole the shock effectively? Whether it's home production of food or possessing livestock, um, we'll, we'll get. We'll definitely run some regressions like that. Um, as far as policy implications of the results, this is a great question or various questions. I think that. One of the implications is that income shocks are not all bad. There are some reductions in overeating and consumption of sugars and overweight, that's good. The problem is there are particular vulnerable populations that demand protection in these circumstances. And this is in particular children under the age of five, especially girls. And so I feel like social protection and support programs should help ensure, not that the whole household is consuming more and that you maintain levels of consumption. Maybe we want the reductions in overweight, but I think that having targeted triggered programs where food support or um, income support can, can be given or encouragement to continue um, standard and diverse feeding for children in younger age brackets during times of downturn, economic downturn and crisis would be very important. These are the populations that are going to suffer most. They're the ones we should keep our eye on and they're where our targeted policies should go. Okay, thank you very much, Katrina. So I understand we're out of time. And I would like to, again, uh, say thank you very much to our speaker and her co-author, Ji Song, to our discussion, Kahraman. And I would like to thank Ahtem uh, Usainov, who's been very useful and helpful in organizing these sessions. Uh, these webinars brought to you by uh, Wyatt, by our partners IFRI and IAMA based in Washington DC and Halle, Germany. So thank you to all of them. So I would like to remind our viewers we're here every Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. Tashkent time. Next speaker, please join us to hear from Thomas Herzfeld, a professor uh, at Martin Halle University based at IAMA, and he will speak about the measurement of agriculture policies. So with that, I would like to thank everyone again and Till next Wednesday. Thank bye bye. You. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you for Thank listening. You. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for organizing. Bye bye. Bye.